This game! Oh, oh, this game has some amazing voice acting! Oh, bollocks! In breaking news, we have shocking developments! That this game is extremely British! Viewer discretion is advised! You what, mate? Well, that's so odd. A Xenoblade game that the majority of people actually like and don't hate for weird anime nonsense? Man, that's crazy! How many copies did it sell? A hundred thousand! Wow. I'm so proud of you. So yeah, here it is, the actual proper Waifu Blade Chronicles 3. No, that last one is just a little drunk night in the town. <laughs> uh, we don't like to talk about it. But if you do care as to why... <laughs> But let's go and see what the third game is all about. So Xenoblade 3 is a brand new story, not linked to the other games. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just choking on this uranium cookie Uni made for me. Drop it, Uni. Where it was sort of at a point where the series you have fans from 1, then from 2, there's weirdos in the corner who like X, and now people wanting a brand new experience with new characters. What the heck are they wearing? The carnival's in town. So the game starts with a clock ticking. <laughs> As we see some kids running in a town square until suddenly... <laughs> and the kid looks up to see something shocking in the sky. As we see some balls merge together. And then the land gets more holes than Swiss cheese. Then we see two warring nations, Kevis and Agnes, where it seems like when their people die, their sparkling wine life force gets sucked up by the enemy's big mech. Damn, Dyson's new vacuum sure is crazy. As we get our main party on the Kevis side, Noah, the main character, lands. He's calling his Sigma mothers. Uni. Powering. And the best character of all. Also some furball with another furball on his head. Go on, move it! Oh yeah, if you're confused in the combat. No, no you won't be. Why? Because they don't stop spamming you with tutorials! It's like they took the biggest criticism of Xenoblade 2. No, not that big. The lack of understanding combat, and now decided to constantly go, Hey buddy, click here! Good job. Yay, you did it. Well, anyway, Kevess wins, as we see. Gee, I wonder who that is. Seemingly creating more kids from test tubes, as that is what these soldiers are. Every one of us is born looking like this. And the game will do a few flashbacks showing them training for war, with each character being a specific type. Lance the tank, Uni the healer. Ah, uh, Yorin? You're a lifesaver, Yorin. And men! These cutscenes sure go on for a while. Wow, they're so stupid! Just go around them! Well, anyway, Yorin sucks, and so Noah tells us how all these test tube babies only have 10 years to live. I'm guessing years are different to ours since he's around 8 years old. As we see them watch a graduation ceremony, where it's not them celebrating surviving one of the toughest parts of your life. No! It's showing you survive for 10 years! And so the Queen Thanos snaps you, and everyone cheered. Also, who the heck is this? Bro, keep that outfit for the bedroom, please! Even the queens come out! Oh, good for her! And there's this guy called an Offseer, which is what Noah is, a flute player who sends the sparkling wine off for the departed. Noah, however, loves his job a little too much and will even send the enemies on a battlefield. Well, you shouldn't do that, Noah! What? Why not? Well, because your friends are bored! Right. I've had about enough of all this depressing crap. Let's head back and hit the showers. I'm all gunked up with blood and sweat. I'm guessing as a Nintendo game, they can't pump up the age rating. Oh, bollocks. Hey, easy on the swearing. And so we gotta run all the way back to our base called Colony 9, complete with unvoiced cutscenes. Ooh, we'll get back to you, don't worry. Ooh, ho, ho. This should be enough for our daily hygiene needs, eh? Uh, no. It's no substitute for a proper bath. Wait, they have baths. Mm. Oh, okay. I guess test you babies have no shame. As they discuss how Noah became an offseer after what happened, which was Yorin getting crushed saving Lance as a kid, and it's still stuck with them. So yeah, main character is kind of like those quiet main characters who think a lot, not emotionally distant, just more not loud or brash or whatever the heck this was. Ah! Lance is the big dumb tough guy, and Uni is the big dumb tough girl. And also... Yes! 
Enrico here. It's just a no pawn who fixes their weapon. Nothing more. But suddenly an alarm rings out, and it seems like Agnes are trying to grab some cargo from an unidentified third party. So Kevez wants it destroyed instead. And they use this online phone thing in their irises that allows them to communicate with each other. Also, it's got a feature called the Collectopedia where people can ask you for materials that you pick up. You know, the things on the ground. One man's trash is another's treasure. And send it to them. Somehow. What, through your eyeballs? What? Why not? And so you go out into the wide world where you fight monsters and different colors indicate the challenge or you come across a team fight where you have a choice to pick between the sides to get different rewards. Really? We're helping you fight bunnies? They are just rabbits. Oh god, no! Hey, I remember you! And as usual after fights, your Xenoblade characters have some very Xenoblade things to say. Hear that, Noah? Lance wants something a bit meatier. Lance wants something a bit meatier. Lance wants something a bit meatier. All right, we get it. Gonna need something a bit more meaty about it. Oh no, not you too. So the flame clock on the big base's mech is what they use for food. As the more sparkling wine they get from enemies, the higher rank they climb in the army as a base. Which gives them a higher social status, meaning more supplies and food. I hear even the highest colonies get Jamie Oliver to cook for them on the battlefield. As we fight more monsters and Mwamba with his timer, which is like an icon tattoo that changes as they grow up to indicate to anyone around how long they have left. And he only has one. Month. You're something else, Mwamba. The pride of Colony 9. Oh, you guys. I was thinking after this op, I think I'm gonna go and put in a transfer to the Salvage Corps. Oh man, I'm just you gonna know, wave this around for a bit. Also in the wild you find treasure chests to open and dead bodies, which Noah can flute up to get some colony affinity, which I don't really know what it does. Anyway, you find a campsite which are the rest areas where you can clean your clothes, as well as level up or down your characters. Also, thankfully after Xenoblade 2's horrendous map, they added a thing where Z, L, and Y now gives you a glowing line to follow. They babied us so much that we can never get lost again! And so we head there and find the two sides fighting over this weird ship's cargo. And Noah is like, we gotta tell Mwamba to hide so he can retire safely and then die at the Queen's hand. Okay then, I'll handle it. Wait, can't you just tell him on your phone thing? I hate to say it. But I think you're right. And so the ship crashes but sends out robots to fight us as the crew jumps out to protect a weird glowing egg. For our precious Ouroboros stone. Hey mate, you sound awfully familiar. However, we get interrupted by Agni and special forces who got fancy weapons. And we get into a big fight. Man, the music in this game is so good. Anyone else reminded of Kill a Kill with this song? And so these three are an actual nerd. Why don't you back off? <sighs> How did she fool my Mondo? Creep. A tiny girl with a big hammer. And uh that girl. Anywho. These guys are tough. Hate to say it. But I think you're right. And so the two fight with the cat girl also being an offseer who uses rhythm to fight, which Noah copies. Also, Noah, I have to mention, doesn't really like the killing and celebrating the Thanos snapping. He's always asking, why do we have to fight? Like, who told us to kill each other in the first place? I mean, come on! Then the Aussie sees our blade and goes, guess this is what they call fight. And stops us from fighting, asking us, why do we fight? You gotta fight the true the enemy, and that enemy, enemy is. Come on, man, you interrupted him. Mwamba? Mwamba. Oh, wait, no, no, what is that? As we see Uni with a weird flashback Uni. to then the it's creature. Can't have that. All right. No! However, the Aussie whose name is Guernica Van Dam Fart. goes and then opens the egg to save the world, which does that Doctor Strange effect on the kids, causing them to pair up in their heads, where they can see each other's memories, and Noah fuses with the cat girl. How are you inside me? Kyrie's inside me? Which causes the monster to go, wow, you into Lincoln's one Ouroboros. Yeah, you probably have heard that term before. And reveals his race is called Mobius, and they are sworn enemies.
Thanks for the exposition. Where now? What the heck? This is so cool. I always knew Monolith wanted to make an Evangelion game. Where we rough Mobius up and he leaves, not before putting out a bat signal in the sky, which alerts all those red armors, saying that now the world will chase after you, Ouroboros. You can't ever go back to your normal lives. Our normal lives are boring, so fine by me, bucko. And so we see Van Damme dying. Can't we just heal them up like we did in the other cutscenes? No. And takes off his mask revealing, oh god, he's old. Behold, the ravages of age. And yeah, due to them only getting 10 years, they never saw an old person before. So I can imagine seeing this to be quite shocking. He says that they must head to Sword March's home if they had to have any chance of defeating Mobius and that they'll have to work together and he dies. Well, I guess this is the other gang. Oh god, not another fuzzball nope on. So this is Mio the Offseer, Senna the Tank, and Tyon the Healer. And and they go their separate ways back to base. Wait, you're meant to team up! Well, we head back. The fog's coming in. However, the colony sends out grunts who have red glowing eyes and they try to kill us! Hey, it's it's me, you, you remember? The big yellow guy? And we see the same with the Agni and three, as we control them running back to the fight area. Bro, why did she walk like that? We need to get some distance or they'll find us. Bruh. Uh-oh. Now while you're running, it was kind of annoying how every single enemy just decides to target you. I don't have time for you. Stop trying to kill me. I don't taste that good. You're very sweet. And they find the other three waiting. What the heck was that day-night cycle? And they both note how their own colonies attack like Mobius said, would tie on the smarty, figuring out the red eyes are the same as the monsters, so they were the ones controlling the colonies. And I guess we form a truce to head to Sword March, since we can't go home. Noah and Mio are happy because they can stop the fighting and work out what's to do with the world they live in. Also, Mio here only has three months left to live. And you know, kinda doesn't want to die. I agree. No letting the cat girl die. Good. So let the introductions begin! My name's Noah. Hi, Noah. Oh, and this is my passion. I can do the 100 metri in 7 seconds. Pretty quick on my toes, I guess. You go, girl. Me and the boys. Inseparable since we left the pod. I'm with my boys! And their no-pon is Manana. Bananas. A chef. Can even cook up a mean Gonzalez eyeball. No, not Gonzalez. And so they gotta resupply and change clothes. Hey, no, don't change out of the funny clothes I gave you. Come on, you got the white and black matching Mio and Noah. The Saturday morning fitness 80s TV outfit center and Lance. And I don't know what these two are meant to be. Hate to say it. But I think you're right. So the girls just change in public, while the boys are a little bit shy. Are you shy to change in front of Mio, huh, Noah? You have a crush on her? I guess. As they move south while a mysterious girl picks up Van Damme's dog tag. Then we get a flashback to how the kids were saved by Colony 4's leader, known as Silvercoat Ethel. I'm sure she won't be featured in the story ever again. As we then see a theater playing the Mobius attack. What the heck? Who's watching this? Oh. Who are you? As it's revealed these consoles, the red guys at every colony, actually were the Mobius, each being a letter of the alphabet. D. These nuts. With the leader being Z. Or Z. And two other mysterious figures. K is then sent to stop us as we cut back to the group. No! Yeah! <laughs> guys. What do you think you're doing? And so we can start our journey! But also make sure you rest at the campsite because you get random bits of interactions in the background. Like Uni and Tyon sharing some famous British cuisine. Tea. Then Nopon try to force push each other. Senna is tricked by Tyon's weapon, which is just... A worthless piece of paper. And Mio... As we head down and Noah's like, okay, we don't have to kill anyone else, right? The player doesn't like it when the heroes kill people, right? I mean, have you seen recent popular media? And we see Tyone is still kind of a bit cautious on all this. He'd rather play it by the book, which does not pair with Yuni's carefree persona. You just call me an airhead, you jerk. Senna is just, you know, a typical valley girl. And, oh no, the giant gorilla. I'll have my revenge in this game. Banana slammer. God damn it. And we find this abandoned mech, but we can open it for some secret treasure inside with these ether cylinders from ether points on the ground. Give me some of that sweet 
Yeah, you see what I mean, Valley Girl. And find some Nopon called Shil Shil. Now that's an outstanding name. Who are part of these wandering shopkeepers that sell you accessories for your characters. As we then cut back to the now grown up Ethel, if you couldn't tell, who runs a tight ship. Commander Ethel, that was all uh, just banter. It was just Banter. And then gets a console sent from the Queen to oversee the group. He tells them to kill the deserters and also controls the colony with his red eye. As we see Noah looking at something. Oh, nothing in particular, really. It's just kind of a habit. Who can now see the icons on the characters, or IE, they can swap classes between the pairs. If you want to see Noah swing Mio's weapons, you sure can. But all the techniques I can use with Okay, what is with this Yakuza learning cutscene? <laughs> And yeah, eventually you get a lot of classes to swap between, I'll show later, but for now I wanted to keep them as default as possible and control Noah because attackers are just so fun. But you got three categories of classes, attackers, healers, and tanks. And the combat's the auto attack as usual, with arts being these abilities you can customize. And for a Keves class, the left side is actually Agni and moves they learn, and funnily enough, the game combines Xenoblade 1 and 2's combat. In that to charge your art, Keves 1's are like Xenoblade 1 where it builds up over time, however the Agnian is like Xeno 2, where it builds up as you do auto attacks, and that's just the general gist of it. It honestly made a lot more sense with the tutorials versus Xenoblade 2, and it doesn't feel as slow at the start because you got six party members. And yes, I have no idea what's happening half the time. Oh yeah, the Collectopedia still works. Yeah, I don't think our colony is happy, we traders are sending them items. And now with Mio, we can do a double send off. As we head into the desert. Oh, seriously? It's right there, but there's no way to it. Oh, a container. Oh, seriously? It's right there, but there's no way to it. Yeah, sure, buddy. And we find out what British people think of the desert weather. Bit of a scorcher, innit? Well, it is hot, and Mio being a cat kinda is dying in the heat. Man, if it was like Xenoblade 2, we could just whip out a frozen blade to fix him right up. However, they see it. It's water. There's an oasis. Oh. Water. Yeah, water. Water. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Oh, so, oh my goodness. Dinosaur. And so the gang cool off and I was kind of annoyed with these random cutscenes. Some characters just change back to their default outfits. Man, I miss Tales of Basiria so much letting me have unhinged comedy with these outfits. Someday a game will let me do that again. But we have our own unhinged comedy here. British comedy. <gasps> Well, Tyon doesn't want to get his glasses wet and tells Noah about these annihilation events, where randomly the world will have chunks of it just destroyed, leading to things like the floating rock. And now we also learn things like crafting gems, which are items to equip to help the classes. For example, give the tanks more aggro so they get targeted and not you. To cooking, which gives you a buff for 30 minutes, and chain attacks, which has possibly the catchiest battle song I've ever heard in a game. Where you build up this bar to then use it in a mode where it's sort of like a mini game. Oh yeah, you can't be mindless about this like I thought in my first playthrough. So you pick a character to attack, and they will only attack if you build this bar to 100. And you do that with the characters in the pool here. Once they're used up, they are gone. And healers cap the bar at 99. You can't use them to push it over to finish. However, if you do finish with a tank or get the bar to 150, you get to reuse one more character in the pool. And this continues until that bar is empty. And if you kill an enemy doing this, you can overkill. Which is like super duper killing them to far more XP. I hope. That all made sense because it's very confusing even with a tutorial. Anyway, the gang continue walking. Hey, can I ask you something? When Mio asked about Noah's blade being all weird, because as a kid he couldn't summon a weapon, well he could but he didn't want to, and Riku here offered him Lucky 7, a super overpowered blade. The legendary swordsmith pon, over course of seven years, forged sword from seven types of steel. Why the heck do you have it? And it's so sharp it cuts to anything. Beans, beans. Oh, Riku, you're mighty suspicious. I mean, it's even more suspicious when you hear his Japanese voice acting. Hey, th there's nothing more to say to that, honestly. So Noah's weapon is now Lucky 7, which is in a sheath that is his own sword. Uh-huh. You don't want to say? Or what? Is it that embarrassing? N no, it's not embarrassing. That's not it. <laughs> I'm getting strong 
emotional vibes here. Yeah, he's a very emotionally vibrant kind of guy. Also, his chest is like bigger than half the cast combined. And now you can edit your party in the menu how they stand. Yes, this is a core feature because... And you got a map to quick travel to locations you find like landmarks as the gang head further into the desert. Hmm. No, it's over there. It's, it's Pikachu. Pikachu! With Ethel attacking us with a flame clock mech. Okay, Google, why did you have to order correct it to that? There you are! You monsters! What monster? How can you see them from that far away? And tell me it's like the killer kill thing again. That's Ethel! You said Ethel. This is Ethel. We know her name, so? So, this is Ethel. With a red eye clouding her vision, she thinks that we are those Kingdom Hearts thingos and doesn't remember us from before. Oh my god, we gotta run away! We can't win with those beams falling around us! Sweet, let's poke around. Oh, they aren't moving. Yeah, no. There is one way to solve this. Well, we run away. Risky business. Hey, you could call it that. Risky business. However, we get cornered and Ethel goes to face us. Hey, how come you don't take any fall damage? Every time I jump from any height, Noah is like... Ugh, that smarts. What smarts? And we fight her. <laughs> I'm going insane. What is happening? And we easily win, but you know, in the cutscene... <sighs> She's way too good. Bro, did you see our damage? However, we try and get through to her. What? What the? <gasps> Consul. Really? This is why I can't stand far. Oh, uh, you wouldn't like Persona 4 then. So this is the Mobius guy who sucks up the sparkling wine of the colony around him to heal back up. And he uses the flame clock to utterly destroy us. Meanwhile, 10 miles away. However, there's this black fog that keeps appearing around and it seems to block his vision. He legit can't see a thing. And in the chaos with Mia and Noah about to die, both Land Senna and Uni Tyon, both without warning, fuse into Ouroboros themselves with their own designs. It seems to happen when someone is in danger. And Noah finally uses his Lucky 7, which somehow his sheath sword turns into a, a glove for some reason. I am Iron Man. And it cuts through the flame clock, releasing all that juicy wine, meaning Mobius can't heal, and we fight. Also, you can interlink now in fights by pressing left on the D-pad, and it gives you a timer, but you have no health bar, and get special attacks, as we kill him. Hey, I thought you said no more killing, Noah. What? Why not? And it's revealed to be another old man. Is this what aging's like? I don't know. And Noah plays that damn flute again. He, bro, loves his job so much. As we explained everything to Ethel, who reminder still has to work for Kevers. Lower your weapons, Bolliaris. Good lord, what is happening in there? Aurora Bolliaris. Well, the colony is freed from the flame clock, and Ethel welcomes us as friends, even though some of the colony still seem a bit angry. What a jerk. And in the first scene in the base, it's not voiced. Look, randomly the game will have these story cutscenes with no voice acting, and they happen so much as the game goes on, and for a modern game, it just feels unfinished. I mean, when you have a low budget game like AI The Somnium Files voicing every single dialogue choice, you would think a Nintendo published game could easily afford to do that. Voice acting helps sell games! Uh, you realize Pokemon has zero voices and still sold way more? Uh. Guess I'm the only one who feels strongly about voice acting. But I want my funny lines! Hate to say it, but I think Uni's the boss. Well, Tyre notes how the Agnian consoles are exactly the same as Kevers, which is odd since, like, aren't mo both countries meant to be fighting each other? A console is such a big deal. And these queens of the countries might also be evil. What? Oh, yeah? As we then see the Agnian queen. Their existence must be erased without a trace. Welsh, Welsh, I heard it! That's a Welsh accent! <laughs> I can't forget that voice in a hundred years! A hundred? Oh, I mean, huh. I wonder what that strange accent is. Maybe it's Scottish, Irish, or perhaps 
Spanish. Now we get Tyon's flashback where he gave a tactical safe plan to attack a Kerbis colony, but was tricked into saying a more aggressive plan to his higher ups, being Nimue and Ice Girl and the Commander Isser. The plan went wrong and they get countered, with Nimue sacrificing herself so Tyon could escape. And now the Mobius Theatre group discuss Kay's death as a tiny one goes to intercept the gang at Isard's colony. With Boliaris telling us how Ethel's uh, colony was silver rank, but now demoted to dirt rank due to Ethel sparring with an Agnian rival called Smoldering Kamaravi. But she didn't kill him, and for this got the whole colony demoted. And we should discuss more in her office. Oh my god, they don't move unless you're in rage, why? And tells us the best course of action to get to Sword March. We can't go over the center of the land due to a raging storm. Possibly Rayquaza infested. Tyon, turns out you were right. As always. And it will take two months to reach, what the heck? Oh god, it's gonna die, no! Can't we just fast travel? Or like, borrow a hover ship or something? Wait, yes, really? We can? <laughs> I'm joking. What a jerk. Also, the gang realize that now Noah's blade can cut through any flame clock. That means Noah! Your blade can save all those colonies from their mind control. You can stop this madness and save the world! Oh, snap. But before that, we gotta listen to people's problems and then discuss at a rest spot to get side quests. And yes, there's no voice acting. But one of them is being yellow as a hero quest and that is voice acted. So we head there, ignoring the unwalkable sand. Where we find Ethel wanting to grab supply drops which are literally dropped from the sky randomly and people fight over them. Man, this place is wild. Well, I guess we should help her out. Roger, and we fight off wolves which was so incredibly annoying. Look, putting a team full of healers works in theory. In theory, in practice, it sucks! Risky business. And helping her out means Ethel now joins your party as a hero. Yes, you got seven party members, the seventh one is always a hero, that can join you after you save their colony. Because yeah, you can actually go back home now to Noah or Mio's colony and get their hero after a quest. Noah's being this guy who really reminds me of a Pirates of the Caribbean British character. Mr. Commander, sir. Five by five. Yes, thank you. Now zip your mouth and let's move. As we learn that they are mad. Mwamba died because of them. Wow. Crap. And heading back to Mio's base. Mio! You're at one piece. Man, her Thank accent so is adorable. Why? Thanks, Mio. Well, the rest of us are moose Where it has loads of high ledges. And yeah, don't fall off with Noah. Ah! Well, it's better than Uni's one. And Mio's hero is a teacher, and he teaches us to walk on said. First, imagine a stake. Your feet are the stakes in this case. Oh, I guess I... No, I don't get it. Amu stake. And his weapon is the floppy stick. Well, Mio checks at Instagram. What's a really a sweaty one? I guess when you smell so nice already, maybe it's no- And the next day, you lose Ethel due to story progression. Gee, that's just great. I suppose. Well, I get another unique animation of Uni and Noah bantering. The thing about Arsenal is they always try and walk in. That is true. <laughs> Santa tells her she's- <laughs> I'm the girl with the gall. As we get interrupted by a hero quest with this Agnian gang. All right, settle down, cameraman. And to get her to join our team, you're gonna defeat each of her squad members. <laughs> As we head around to find a very Anakin scary place, where Monolith shows you why they are the greatest game developers. <laughs> and we see this robot girl protecting Nopon. Oh, uh, look at them go. As we save her and she's interesting. Courage to the black wicked monsters. To offer aid to total stranger bug. Very interesting. And for a quest, we gotta find some high ether. No, not regular ether. Ether that uh makes you high. I need some more ether. No, 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 no way! I'm already over a shtick. So yeah, Eno is fun well, in her uh, own way. And we grab that high ether, which is now scattered in the overworld, to give Eno for her to. Huh? What the? Wow, that hit all the right spots. Did she just? Drink the cylinder? 
please tell me I hallucinated that. And she's an artificial blade made by a horny old no-pot. Oh, God, no, not again. Huh, Riku, you were mighty quiet during this whole ordeal. And look, it's very obviously inspired. I know that adorable robotic sway anywhere. And here you can use the ether to upgrade her that you find in the overworld. So I think I'll use it as my main hero for now, with Noah copying her class as each hero gives you one class to pick from, and putting Mio as the attacker. Also in the menus, you can customize the interlinks, changing the moves and such. Check out this sick new skill. Check out this sick new skill. Yeah, don't do it in one go. Check out this sick well, we head further into the valley. Oh, geez, this hole is dangerous. Hey, Senna, get away from the ledge. Meanies. What was that, Senna? Meanies. What are you talking about? As we were about to climb some vines, but then split up to find a way around. However, a kid with a mech comes to beat us up, uh, we, so we regroup. Yeah, what was the point of splitting up? God damn it, kid, get out of here. Thank you so much, large man. Landsman. I mean, land. So his mech breaks and we gotta fix it to move on. I don't know, man. I just didn't like this part at all. Stop joining my party. That's what my master pond told me. Wait. Master Pond. Hang on a sec. Eno just told us what that word meant. How did you forget? Why are you lying? Oh, please let this end. It never ends. So we defeat his console. A console. Games are for winning. By launching and smashing, I'm getting way too good at this combat. Anyway, he teaches us the climbing skill so we can just move on where we find a rope. Hey, so in this game, do the characters just snap to the rope? You betrayed me. That's funny. What's funny? It's funny, it puts your mind at ease. I think I could get used to this. So yeah, it is weird how the animals in the world actually age, but none of these soldiers ever noticed. Well, Tyon sees a tree and is like, Holy moly, that reminds me of Nimue! As the new console thinks about mind controlling Isid, but has another scheming plan for us. And I learned that robots dancing is adorable! Oh yeah? Yeah, oh yeah, it's adorable! Oh yeah? Oh yeah. Did I just find another common phrase in a JRPG again? Oh yeah? Oh yeah, in the chain attacks, you can use the heroes as another member. And they also have an added bonus, so be careful to read them all because they are quite different. Well, they find an old battleground with only Keva's bodies lying about as Uni sees... What the hell? A copy of herself? Then remembers dying to a Mobius and is traumatized by the weird memory. How incredibly odd. Tyon notices she is troubled at night and gives her the thing that calms all British people down. Tea. But we try and avoid the Issa colony and go underground where we get this quest with Riku. Really? Wanting gemstones. Well, he's like... Not on very pacifistic and don't fight. But then is like... <laughs> And we get them both as a hero to use in battle. As I admire the scenery. Right, Mimi? It's pretty mind ah! Riku no thing or two. Four. Three. And we head further in. Crossing here. Do you see any other way? Just try not to look down. As we then fight spiders. Oh no! Anyway. However, we get purple gas, which was the same tactic Tyon used in the flashback that killed him away. And so we have to escape. Water. 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 And head into the river outside, leading to Colony Lambda with its third, whose flame clock mech is a giant turtle. Oh, what the heck? We have to fight it. Gonna need a big view for this. Isid is under mind control, but instead of seeing a monster like Ethel did, he uses Tyon's tactics against us to make Tyon feel bad for Nimue's death. However, this emotion allows the gang to do flip fusions, where it's more focused on Tyon, Senna, and Mio in the design and attacks, where now in combat you can do the fusions to either form, as they flip the turtle on its back, which is hilarious because it can't get up, and destroy its flame clock. However, Tyon goes, all right, Isid, kill me. Just stop all this madness. But Isid turns into mud, what the heck? As the short console appears, revealing himself to be Letter J, who is... Yorin. Yes, Yorin, who did die back then, but now somehow is a Mobius, shocking our Keves group. Have you ever felt so much fondness that it made you quiver? 
its ability to turn people's memories into mud puppets. As we see the full death flashback how Yorin saved lands, but now Yorin is happy he did die to become greater than us and fight. Or I had fun wrecking him with our Ouroboros chain attacks. Well now you can use them in this move after successfully pulling up say Mio and Noah's attack and they will fuse together for big big damage. Also if you hold ZR and do a combined up, side or down attack, it helps increase the fusion level so that when you do fuse, you can use the special abilities on the arts because this is how I was able to easily smash earlier. As Yorin leaves and we find Isod in his colony mostly unhurt, we were just fighting mud puppets and Isod calms Tyon down about Nimue. While Mio and Noah send off the mud puppets. Bro, it's just mud. You really have a flute addiction. You what, mate? And Lance gets annoyed like with every bro character in a JRPG and Noah has to reason with him that it's not his fault that Yorin died. While we see the Mobius laughing over the army's fighting as this golden guy here watches on with Z. Well, that was Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Yeah! Well, I gotta say, I really enjoy this game a whole lot more on replay, at least. I think I was just a bit disappointed after the DLC had won. I was worried 3 wouldn't live up to the hype of X and 2, but it has done so much improvement on the gameplay side. Like, man, it somehow runs even better than 2 in portable mode with all this stuff on screen. I will say I'm slowly liking the quirky characters, although they aren't as quirky as these bozos. I do miss that JRPG cringe, though. But man, the combat is so fun and the music is so good, and the story starts off way harder despite some annoying moments, but eventually it goes to some crazy places. However, sadly the game ends. As we see Kamaravi in some jail talking to that golden guy, and our party finds a weird portal which Lance touches, and it transports them to another dimension where they die or something, never to be seen again. Oh no! Anyway- Still. It was a nice chat. But man, this is so disappointing! The character named Kitty doesn't have cat ears. No! And after defeating a turtle, we can now explore Isard's colony. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not doing his hero quest. Look, I mean, you get so many of them, but you can only use one at a time. And I'm still enjoying the robot goofball. And also, I think his base is cursed. Like, why are they constantly sporting? Well, anyway, we head back to Sword March. Oh, a dragon. How are you easier than a giant gorilla? Well here I learned that while you're in your Ouroboros form and start the chain attack, you actually get a different finisher where you first interlink as Noah, then another round with Mio for a lot more damage. While the gang learned that they shouldn't interlink for too long, otherwise they will overheat. Think it's something dangerous? Well it can't be anything fun. You expect balloons and confetti with that noise. Maybe not. Aww. As we learn that the next Mobius... P. Yeah, maybe naming after the alphabets was not the best, eh? Anyway... Bird up. And I guess Tyon's full backstory just wraps up where Nimue gave her watch to him, which has her memories on it. As it goes, you wearing a watch and watching a sports match, that watch has memories of the match because it's in the watch, I think. So Tyon having the watch where anytime he watches them more will make more memories. I think. Well, Noah and Mia are already acting like a 30 year long married couple. Come on, propose already! I'm just joking. And I spy with my little eyes some treasure. Holy moly, is that a Xenoblade 2 reference? Yeah, I like this, you know. As we see an otter. Uh. Is that? First time seeing it. Yeah. So they see Kevin's castle and continue through a forest. As we see Ethel having to report back to the queen. Mom. Also, why do British people pronounce it like mum? Are you my mommy? Maybe. Also, N is here, the golden console. You know, those rare ones you win in magazines? N shows Ethel the Annihilator, a device on the castle that can cause those annihilation events at a distance. And N is kinda hilarious. I'm saying an attack like the one you just witnessed can be delivered anywhere. Why did he say it like that? Anywhere. Also, no, he doesn't look like anyone we know. Get out of here. Only idiots would think he looks like anyone. You see, when I streamed the game, I didn't know he was- Mind you don't slip! <laughs> Mia also does the oldest trick in the book, pretending to faint so that Noah catches her. That container... Doesn't look like we can get to it from here. 
Why is she so adorable? I can cut. Riku then calls us Super Villain Pond. And Manana Super Villain Pond. Just cause we fight. Hey, don't you say You're anything, you fuzzballs. I see how you fight. <laughs> Wait a minute. Riku? When did you appear in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Mona Lisa? And heading through, the gang get attacked. Judy, look out! Get down, Mr. President! No! <laughs> And they find a hero who, despite having cat ears and being an archer, is not voiced by Kitty Archer, who is the voice of Uni. Well, I wouldn't change Uni's voice for all the mac and cheese in Utah! I'll hit him, and then I'm gonna hit him again! And after their quest line, you unlock the robe sliding feature. Off we go! Man, Santa is so funny. Woo! Because you never skips leg day! Well, the group camps for the night, but some birds steal all the food! Yes! Well, after getting mad at a hungry Manana... Manana is bottomless pit. Mama? As we see... Did they just repeat the voice slide? And wait a minute, how can they see this? Do they have cameras all around? Drones? Maybe? I don't know. Glad Riku had just power frame last night. Should perform 30% better than leading brand. What's she on about, leading brand? But then again, I'm so suspicious of them all. Ujima flip. Also, yeah, this model bending is so cursed. As we grab some food, and learn about how Mia got her flute from Miyabi, who died and gave her the flute to keep the dream alive. You know, it's sort of like Tyon's thing. Also a dream that's gonna be short-lived because she's on her ninth life. One more de facto partner's running full steam ahead. I mean, I can't very well go backwards, can I now? Your partners now, eh? And now we get a cutscene when Boliaris tells us what happened to Ethel. And man, it has to load each scene back and forth. Please, Nintendo, make a console that has an SSD so Monolith can load all the things they want. Like a Zeta Blade X port. Who said that? So Aurora says N threatened to destroy Ethel's colony because the Queen knew about the flame clock being destroyed. And only if Ethel kills the Ouroboros, you know us, will they spare Ethel's colony. And even more so, Kamaravi has been told to work with her in this new mech they make with the help of PNO. Huh. With PO cruises. So he gives us the map for the castle and how to sneak in to destroy the Annihilator, which Ethel had snuck to him before he ran off. Man, this is getting so serious! Every time we run, why do we always end up getting drenched? I mean, feathers are a bitch to dry. Is it really swearing if a Nintendo character says it? Shit. Well, anyway, let's continue. Also, yes, I am still annoyed there's no voice lines, you know? Like, come on, it would've been quite funny hearing Uni say this! Fate. Yeah, yeah, we love the designs in Fate. Fate, you say? As they camp in this very fantasy-esque castle. It's an apartment building. We're Mio realizing that she's a cat and that they never help out in the kitchen. Ugh. She gets mad she only has two months left to live and this journey is just taking so long and runs off. I mean, I get that, but we- You don't get it, not at all. I'm just a regular guy. As Tyon doesn't know what a high five is- Ujima flip. What, sorry, but I refuse to debase myself like this. Enrique! <laughs> Sound effects not help comprehension. Well, the next morning, the gym buddies go gymming as Mio and Noah apologize. No, Mio, don't be sad. Don't do the floppy ears. No. So Noah has the brilliant idea of swapping flutes so that Miyabi's flute will get to be used a bit longer. It doesn't always work, even that. Like last night. Oh, that. That was me being selfish. But now, I feel like we're starting to get on the same wavelength. Look over there. Anybody else feeling curious? Wow, I didn't die. I'm sorry. But outside the weird forest we meet. That voice. 
Ethel? We know her name, so? And we go to fight with the consoles watching, with us easily winning. So, oh, mind controls Kamarabi's eye. However, the dude would rather stab his eye out than listen. Wow, well, Nintendo, you can swear, but no red blood. Mata. What was that? Arsehole. So three of the clocks, they now help us killing the consoles. Oh, hey, come on, why are you fighting each other? Tear is the purpose of my life. Bro, you know you could have just know. helped us fight the you consoles? No, the good character design, but also this guy who I barely don't know about, so I don't feel that bad. Well, O and P have to now fight. Oh, lordy, he coming. And now fights us by interlinking their Mobiuses. Oh, damn, that's so strong. How will we win? As Mio gets really mad. And the two Mobius don't realize that they also overheat, making black fog appear around them. We push them off and they explode in a big annihilation event. <coughs> Queen's fingers, that was close. Oh yeah, Uni has a real fascination with the Queen's body parts. Queen's wings and Queen's heels. Am I Why in the Queen's snow white wings does she want from us? Sleep well? Yeah. Well, sort of. Well, your eyes are red. Hey, shut up. So what if they are? And we move on. They'll come. Well, we reach Kevin's castle, but the front door, according to Noah, who has been here on Offseer camp, says it will be heavily guarded. So we should go around the back. But what if I just turn around and go through the front? Um... Hi? Truly, this is why. We'll never be able to stop fighting. So this is Ashira, who surprisingly helps us fight Kavesi, even though she is Kavesi. Now it's open season. Wait, what? Ashira's also got very nice design. Friends say but, why but? So fine, I'm doing a hero quest, where she, for various reasons, wants to kill her own colony. You're insane. Maybe you really have lost it. You knew that's too far, even for you. I'm feeling a little miserable, but I can take it all out of my men, no problem. Yep, it's official. We found the worst commander. Uni, that's too far. So it's like her colony is fighting her because this console is mad at her. With a single order, I could have you creatures crushed this instant. Oh, really? However, Ashira lets her live because she wants to fight her again later. I don't know what to say. This woman is something else. Honestly, it's kind of awesome. No one's ever talked that way to me before. I guess... I'm happy? Maybe? You ain't embarrassed, are you? You! <laughs> this is priceless! Yeah? Couldn't you tell I was joking? I really seriously hate you. Yeah, so I'm gonna be using her as a hero, okay? Don't even ask for anyone else. Your life, your choices, man. But I can still collect more of them and see their storylines. So how about this guy called Grey? His deal is to give us guns. It was a warning. A small test. What's this crap now? Honestly, I don't get this dude. Seriously, Uni is like the best character to bounce oh, off. Friend. What with her quips? Man. So I swapped to his class, but I don't know, I kind of didn't feel like doing the ranged attacks in this game. I love it more with the physical weapons where you can feel the hits. You know what I mean, Uni? Bish, bash, bosh. Exactly. As we sneak around to the castle. Well, that girl from earlier spies on us. And now we have to get up close the quiet way. Or... Ah! And the goal is to sneak onto the mining ship so they load us onto the castle. Yeah, it's very sneakily. And once inside, we sneak on out, where I once again was picky with my classes because I realize I'm just a player who will play one character. I don't swap them out in combat, which means I need to have my party members have the abilities to topple and launch, you know, so you can make the enemies do the funny spinning. So yeah, you're going to see me randomly change between a few classes in the upcoming footage. However, as we reach the Annihilator, we get interrupted by the first Mobius we met. Stop. Who shows his face to be some blonde guy called Dirk? Oh, okay then, just some guy. Who is also helped by Joker as they now both fuse together and fight. However, Uni has a little story arc getting mad at D, being in her memory by distracting them while the gang destroy the cannon. And yeah, I don't know what's happening here. Before pushing DJ off, however they manage to escape. Also, yes, a monolith, I know you're very funny calling them DJ. Well, we see the two nerds. 
as we try and escape, but somehow end up in the Queen's throne room and meet the Queen Melia. You have returned. Uh, speaking of, did you know the voice actor for her actually was the first confirmation we got of this game's existence? Yeah, she accidentally revealed it! And yep, she's a famous celebrity now who still wanted to come back to do this voice. She meant to be some kind of celebrity! Also in the room are these pods, the ones that were used to create all the child soldiers, as we see, Ethel being born again! Wait, what? However, after fighting and almost winning, but she randomly gets invincibility frames, it's revealed that Melia is... Oh, yeah, that would be dumb connecting this to the other Xenoblade games. They would not do that. It's just a fake Melia. <laughs> just a reference. Anyway, N goes to kill us by giving Noah headaches. <laughs> but before that, Van Damme's team comes in to steal some pods, and we use this commotion to escape. N gets all mad and takes off his mask to reveal he looks uh, very similar to Noah. And then this console M appears, who looks very similar to Mio. Wait. What? As we now get a flashback to Senna for her little backstory, where she experienced American bullying. Totally. Right. <laughs> and to cope, she would copy Mio. Well, outside the castle. But aren't you a ginormous sparker? And as we reach the base of Sword March, Van Damme's crew comes out to greet us with that girl called Shania, who was spying on us earlier, and Monica, the leader of the people in the city, who live inside the sword and oppose Mobius. They then give us eye patches to block Mobius from spying on our location with our eyes. Oh, so that's how they tracked us before. Wait, but it's in the eye. How did they see the camera angle from above? It's warrior? best not to think about it. And yes, this important cutscene is not voiced. Yeah. And it's kind of cool now that in every cutscene, menu, even chain attacks, they all wear the eye patches. And Monica here is the daughter of Van Damme, which surprises the group because what the heck is a daughter? What does that mean? Weren't you born in a tube like us? And now inside the city, they find residents whispering about them as they meet Ouroboros candidates who, along with Shania, were not chosen as the Ouroboros as only six can exist at a time. As Van Damme hitting that button back then made us suddenly get the powers instead of these six. Where now Monica gives us the lore of the game. You, um... Man, that Dead or Alive game back then really was influential to gaming, huh? That's outrageous. So Monica says to follow Shania. What's that? I see some Look, relations have changed. Maybe we can go this way. You just said to follow her! Also, it's weird and annoying how the gang will do two lines of dialogue after a cutscene when you walk, but I don't know how slow people walk because sometimes it cuts off that second line when you reach the next part. Hey Noah, you know that pile of husks earlier? You aren't thinking about sending those on, are you? Will Noah send the husks on with his flute? I have to know if he will do the thing that he always does! So pretty much they steal the baby pods from Mobius because the cycle of life is that once people die, they get reborn in the tubes over and over, with the flame clocks feeding Mobius. Essentially an infinite feeding livestock for them, which is why Ethel was reborn but now has no memories. Monica says this is not how the world is meant to be! You're meant to be pumping out babies! That's the cutest f***ing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Who wants to know how babies are made? So after learning what couples do on a Friday night... <laughs> We get taken to statues based on the founders of the city. Six people, the first Ouroboros, who everyone in the city is descended from. And the legend is that there's two real queens, not the robot Birdo here, created the Ouroboros to defeat Mobius. And we have to find them to return the world to how it was. You know, smelly babies and smelly old people. Well, the goal is to now sneak into the Agni inside's prison to bust out Gondor, who knows where the queens are. And we have to do a long fetch quest to get the materials to make a ship to traverse to see. In traverse we do. Well, ain't no Kingdom Hearts 3. And now in the city you can actually meet another hero. All right people, what say we get a move on? Time waits for no Konyashenti. Yeah, okay, keep your air on. Who as a rich, rich sounding person wants us to escort them to Annihilation Zone. To Annihilation Zones? You must have nerves of steel. Marching straight into Annihilation Zones. Where we find... It's... a rock? Oh yeah? 
which is a byproduct of the annihilation, i.e. it's a fancy cool gem she wants to sell because she's a gem person. Oh, yes, she's wait, so fancy you... she speaks huh? the ye olde English. Nevermore. Nevermore. And now a thing is that at rest spots we can craft accessories with random effects. Hey, they bought RNG back. But okay, fine. She's the new waifu. Alright, Ashira, onto the vents. I gotta try her out on the team. And wow, she also wears an eye patch too. And so back to the ship, which is indestructible, Ooh. where you got so many islands to explore, like this one with the puzzles, an island of ladies who are very good friends, and we have to find info on how to sneak into prison. We fight Agnian forces, but holy moly, changing classes like this, having to balance tanks, attackers, and healers, man, I almost died with her. Uh... I'm sorry, you're just not what I was looking for in a hero. Well, back to the constantly swapping classes till I get it right, I swear I will. As we break into the Agnian Guardhouse, where if you also lower the level on characters, it boosts their affinity. That is to say, having heroes and people wearing that class outfit on your team boosts this orange bar on the other characters to then let them unlock their class. So if you want characters to try out a class that is locked on this screen, fight higher level monsters to speed that process up. Well, we finally sneak into the prison and climb through the air ducts before finding Gondor, who Turns out, is Monica's daughter. And also... Huh? Huh? Cut the crap! Any lights on in there, you dead brain? The absolute worst voice in a JRPG. No. I-I-I've heard worse. <laughs> Oh my god, is that a horrible fake Australian accent? Like my ears actually hurt every time I hear her speak! I sure hope she won't be important in the end game. Ted. Yikes. However, she's happy living a current life and doesn't want the world to change. So who fights us? Are we win in battle, lose in cutscene? And she's like, fine, okay, take this necklace which will open the gate to the Agnian Queen. How and why do you have it? When all is lost, let him hear you roar. Lands and Senna get some bonding time. <laughs> <laughs> you look short. Hey, you're the same height. Hey, you too, Shania. So turns out Shania tried copying Gondor's style back in the day, which annoyed her, mirroring what Senna did with Mio. They all are the same, okay? And all the while, you gotta do manual prison tasks like picking up items, picking up more items, killing giraffes, you know, the usual British prison stuff. But on the third day, we organize the escape with, oh no, God, no, don't join my party. Well, I guess I have less tanks now. And make for the exit. However, someone told the guards about this and turns out it's Shania who doesn't want a world where you only get one chance at life and if you die, that's it. Am I crazy? Am I saying something strange? Well, um, I actually, uh... However, we distract the guards while Gondor makes a break for it, but then M and N turn up, giving both Noah and Mio headaches! Will we learn the truth about Noah and Mio's clones? Will Noah ever send those husks in the city? Will Ashira beat me up? Find out next time on Waifu Blade Chronicles, only if this video gets 4.5k likes. And you want to see the next part, right? Because surely nothing bad will happen to any of the characters in a scene that is one of the most heartbreaking scenes in the entire trilogy, right? Oh, come on. You've already told us that much, you might as well give us the whole story. Okay, fine, I'll finish the game. If you promise to not keep stealing the tuna from the pantry. Lame. So Eminem are not a rapper, but rather Noah and Mio. What? No way! While Gondor just escapes, as M goes, uh, hey, N, uh, can I fight them by myself? And does this weird stare off with Mio. M cries seeing another cat girl and then fights her with the power, allowing her to take over other people's bodies. Uh, it's kinda broken, huh? As lands in center die. But not really. Phew, glad no one really dies in this game. As console Xbox interrupts us. X. So N is like, I'm bored and puts everyone in jail, with Mio in a separate one. And a reminder the eclipse is happening in one month. Meaning, Mio is gonna die? Nah, I'm sure it's fine. And we literally spend one month in the cell watching Noah go insane. And the homecoming begins when Mio gets Thanos snap. 
and thus the cat girl dies. And that was a chapter 5 scene that everyone cried at except me because my entire stream chat was telling me weeks in advance, oh, you're gonna cry at chapter 5, you're gonna cry, okay? So of course, I'm gonna try to not cry, stop trying to get me to cry, it doesn't work like that! Everyone you knew or loved is dead! These things happen. As N kills Noah, where in the next chapter, we see Noah tripping balls, and he gets asked if he wants to sit in the Endless Now, as a series of flashbacks show him past lives of Noah and Mio, all ending in death where they try to stand up against Mobius, and one cycle even has them having a kid. Gee, glad that education helped! And we see Noah watching this in the theater as we meet Z. Zed, who says he's the leader of the world and offers this Noah to spend forever with Mio, and he accepts becoming N. Our Noah is like, and to change the world from this cycle and never become that N, because they keep being reborn in a cycle, so our Noah is just one version of N being reborn. And then he snaps back to reality as M's power stops the execution, and it's revealed that M, the body swapping one, actually back then swapped bodies with Mio and pretended to be her, so she's the one who died instead. And this is our cat girl. Sure, okay. And this makes N go sicko mode. <laughs> Saying how only he can have the cat girls and this makes Noah mad and he pulls out a sword from his chest called the Sword of Origin which is so incredibly OP and wounds N while he escapes with X. And Shania tries to cosplay as a Persona 3 character. Oh. Wrong universe. So Mio says he is the problem and that's the thing they gotta go kill. And the group's gotta use the key Gondor had to find the queen, who is revealed to be... Oh, come on! They were just about to reveal who she is! So we fight DJ and Yorin is like, Yeah, I saw all my past lives when I became Mobius. In every life, I was a nerd. So that's why I became the Joker. And he dies. Well, how's that going for you, you nerd? Man, what a boring villain. Lame. That bastard. Stuck me good, he did. Two set trees to the side and things that have been a sight twist. And so the queen wakes up and it's her. Oh. Oh, her! Yes, she's back! In all her white glory! No! And she explains the whole lore of Xenoblade 2, where after their own game, Nia and Melia's planet, you know, Melia from Xenoblade 1, their planets collided! And then it split into two, and then it's gonna collide again and destroy everything! So they made Origin an arc that would survive and reboot the two worlds afterwards. And that's the cycle of rebirth, meaning that you technically couldn't really die in this world, but only sometimes, the other times, you actually do die forever, so... However, Z interrupted this, freezing it in time to be the Endless Now, and placed Melia inside Origin to control it, meaning he controls this fake world. So Nia made some Ouroboros stones, somehow, while Noah's sword was created by Melia, somehow, and says in the sea is that's where Origin is, so you need a ship to get there. And so it begins more fetch quests, ah oh, yeah sure I love this. Well at least we could do more hero quests. My word. I'm healing in places I didn't even know I had. I'm coming. So they head to Origin and find Melia, but N is already there, somehow. And N just looks so sad without his cat girl. So we convince him to see the truth, which causes him to merge back into Noah. And Melia is freed, saying Z is less a person and more a concept of the fear of the future. She then says where Z is, nods at Riku, and teleports home. Hey, wait, what do you know, Riku? Oh yeah, Monica and Gondor are here. Gee. Great, can't wait to hear her voice again! And what do I see but you dads having a pee? Oh, and so we finally reach the movie theater where he is enjoying himself. And so we fight, which is kind of a weird fight because oh my god, did they not want you winning easily? Where's he is spouting stuff like this? Utility. Noah then breaks the theater and Z turns into a giant head, while Melly and Nia disable all their flame clocks and activate their castle's mechs to budge Origin. Bro, the Switch can't handle this! And Melly and Nia join the fight, so we finally win as Z implodes. And thus it's over, when Noah chucks his sword into the sea as the party say goodbye as their world split back apart. Melly are looking fondly at Shulk's big, big blade, while Nia... I'll see you soon, that You die of and it cuts to the start of the game where Noah is a kid again and he has flutes and runs toward them as the game ends. 
Huh. So you just randomly drop Epilogue Law to Xenoblade 2 without any explanation and just leave? Why would you do that? At least show some of the goofy family time. How did Rex marry three people? Like, how is their daily life? And what's with that ending? Is it a time reset? Did everything we just planned not really happen? Did the other worlds just continue on? And to answer my question, they then announced the post-game expansion DLC almost a year later. Yes, you have to pay for the ending. Which is actually not the ending. It doesn't explain or show anything at all, but instead it's a prequel to Xenoblade 3. And we know how much I love Xenoblade prequels. Maybe. Maybe. So it starts with Shulk, Rex, and Z fighting Alvis. Man, if this was your first entry into the franchise, I feel so sorry for you. As we meet the new main character, Matthew. I must be some kind of genius. And A, his sidekick. Or more like his owner, because Matthew really acts like a crazy Labrador puppy. So Matthew's backstory is that N killed his granddad back in the day, and now he finds Kevis and Agnes fighting, but ends up easily beating them because he's got some big punchy arms. Yeah, I knew. <laughs> and A frees the two by slicing their clocks. Nicole here is a scared baby and stays with them. However, Glimmer runs off, still wanting to fight for her country. Now, the gameplay here is pretty similar. You got these two sides to attack, and you get this new mega super duper ability, which is when you launch an enemy, you press the left button to do a super duper mega move. Uh, maybe it's not working. Also, I don't think this mode is without the cat girls, as Matthew has a sister, not L. How does that work? The ears just skip a whole sibling? Well, his granddad is this guy, as his parents were Noah and Mio. Yep, the baby making ones we saw earlier. However, Glimmer gets caught by Shulk, who works as the Liberators. Glimmer, though, is still crazy for a country and calls them up to save her. And they arrive, but since Glimmer has no clock, she's of no use to them. And so it looks like all hope is lost as we arrive, and the enemy fuses into a huge Mobius. But then Rex appears. Sounding completely different. Yeah, so Shulk has the same voice actor, but Rex is clearly different now. I guess the best VA didn't want to come back for his masterpiece. Ah! Also, it's so hilarious seeing people go, yeah, Rex is cool now. Well, I'm here in 2018 saying Rex was always good. Did the man really have to grow a beard to make you change his mind? So we win, and yeah, Glimmer is Rex's kid, and Nicole is Shulk. Does that mean we get to see their mothers in the game? And how they all act as a big crazy family? Well... <laughs> a is also recognized by Shulk as when N killed the granddad, it caused the conscience of Ontos to separate and take the form of A here. I'm just speaking gibberish to a lot of you. With the remainder being called Alpha. And Alpha was kind of bored and decided to erase the current world and replace it. Oh look, by the way, it's a cat sister. Now being used as a host by Alpha. And now Shulk and Rex give the law on how there was one world that it ripped it to do, and now they're going to collide back into one world, so they built Origin to stop this. But Alpha Alpha wants to replace the current world with the help of Nihel. And so we gotta head for Prison Island, and yeah, you do get to play as Shulk and Rex. And yes, I just played as Rex non-stop. He's so broken! I told you so! Niall though appears and transports everyone somewhere else! And that place is... Ah, oh, what the hell? Not Ohio! Yeah... Uh... Yeah... And imagine showing this to someone out of context. It's more confusing than Rex's wife's picture! Speaking of, is Rex ever gonna talk about it? Is he gonna mention it to Glimmer? You know, his daughter? And how he actually meant it back then when he said he loved all you guys? No? They're just gonna ignore that whole thing? Maybe. So this is a memory of Klaus as well. Do you remember Klaus, that blonde guy missing half his balls? Niall believes this is the perfect world promised by Alpha, but A says the truth is actually this world gets destroyed. And so Alpha appears and goes to fight, and man it was a crazy fight using all our knowledge in the expansion, and you fuse together and punch Alpha and win. And then A, Shulk and Rex realize they need to keep Origin running so they volunteer, as Origin sinks into the sea. As we see the city being built leading into the third game, and and then we see the end of the main game, where the two worlds are back to being separate, and the third world appears as a blue streak of light heads to the new one, and the whole trilogy ends. Yep, that's how this all ends.
You see why I don't like Xenoblade as much as the others? That doesn't explain anything! I still don't even fully understand what's happening here. I mean, Xenoblade 3 probably has the best gameplay apart from X, but it's like Monolith really thinks the viewer will just understand all this. It also seems like they tried to make the game understandable for new fans, yet that meant they were trying to tie up a whole trilogy story. I mean, Xeno 4 could continue on, but it kind of feels like they are ending it here. But then they just open up lore about Xenoblade 1 and 2 characters, you know? We want to know what happens to them. They suddenly have kids and they just never elaborate on it. Like, who is that third kid if one is Glimmer and the other is Mio? Kind of feels like a Kingdom Hearts 3 sort of deal. You keep adding all these elements over all these games. You've got to buy all these DLC and all these other things. And then... Nah, it's not a conclusive ending, you, you know, it might continue on, who knows. And I feel only super diehard fans will get something out of this, making me realize I kinda only just love Xenoblade 2 and X and everything else is just okay for me. I really feel like this game needed some more lighthearted comedic moments, as so much of it was just serious story stuff non-stop. And it's kinda sad to me that after seeing a lot of people love it, meaning Monolith is probably gonna continue on in this trend and make more games like 1 and 3 and less like 2 and X. And in the meantime, Hopefully Monolith can explain about Riku. Yes, he was there. He was always there. Even in the DLC. Watching. Waiting. Oh no, don't turn into a Lovecraft monster! Trojan, Ramses, Magnum, Sheik! And a big cheesy thank you to my patrons, including Commitimus Crime, Cox or Sin, Gerardo Cruz Alvarez, John Portugal, Master Pro Mui, Nira, and Worker B. 